Broadcasting from New York City to the world, it's the G-Man Interviews. Welcome. My guest is Michael Long, former chairman of the Conservative Party of New York State. Mr. Long registered as a member of the New York State Conservative Party in 1964 and was elected as a district leader of the Conservative Party in 1968. He was elected chairman of the Kings County Conservative Party in 1972, vice chairman of the State Conservative Party in 1974, executive vice chair in 1985, and state chairman in 1989. He stepped down from his position in January of this year. The U.S. Marine Corps veteran has appeared in three previous episodes, and he joins me for this very special installment to discuss his 30-year reign, President Donald Trump, his displeasure regarding the policies and practices of Governor Andrew Cuomo and other New York Democrats, and the future of the Republican Party. As always, it's a pleasure to welcome you back to the show, sir. Uh, good to be with you. Thank you very much for bringing me on the show. A number of high-profile Republicans, including former Republican National Committee Chair Michael Steele and The View co-host Megan McCain, have publicly stated that Donald Trump has caused such a rift in the GOP that it's no longer recognizable. Do you agree with that assessment, and was it a factor in your decision to step down? Oh, no, it had nothing to do with my... Um, <laughs> I don't want to disappoint them or you, but uh, um, look... I, I have some problems with the president's demeanor at times, but I clearly have no problem with his policies. I think he's moving the country in the right direction. I think he's, he's living up to his campaign promises, which is a little unusual. You don't usually see um, candidates, after they get elected, live up to their promises. And he is doing exactly that. And I think that's uh, very, very, very positive. I understand Meghan McCain's, uh, you know, President Trump and her father didn't get along, okay? And uh, they had some harsh words, and maybe the president was partially to blame for that. So she has, you know, as a daughter, she doesn't forgive the president for that, and I understand that, and that's that's understandable. As far as the former chairman, I, he's, I consider him a friend. I worked with him. I know him. I, I think he's just a never-Trumper, and... So there are never Trumpers that just can't get over the fact that uh, that Donald Trump, in fact, became president of the United States, and um, uh, they just can't get over it. You believe the president has been nothing but a positive as far as everything that's currently happening in the country? Well, I, when you look at the economy, you look at job growth, you look about the companies that are coming back to uh, – uh, the country. Uh, if you look at the appointment from my perspective of the judges, um, both the Supreme Court judges and uh, the federal judges, uh, you look at the fact of him bringing the attention of uh, securing our border and uh, declaring, basically declaring war on MS-13, um, uh, issue after issue, looking at the fact that he has enunciated and really spoke out very strongly that um, you know partial birth abortion is is a barbaric act and it it shouldn't happen here in America. So I, you know, from a philosophical point of view, I truly believe he has uh, moved in the right direction and is doing a good job. When you look back on your thirty years of service. Would you say you've become optimistic or pessimistic about conservatives and conservatism in New York State? Well, I am optimistic about conservative policies and conservative points of view. I would be pessimistic, though, uh, about uh, the in the direction the state is going and what the elected officials now in this state are doing, including the governor governor of the state of New York. Clearly, is this governor and the newly elected legislature are taking our state clearly in the wrong direction. Um, I'm very happy that um, Amazon is coming to New York City, but we didn't have to give the store away to get Amazon. We gave all sorts of taxpayers' money and promises to the richest company in, in the entire world, uh, the MTA 
transit system just doesn't work. And, you know, the governor can try to push blame on uh, the uh, mayor of the city of New York, but it's his responsibility. Um, you take a look at upstate New York, and look, New York City is doing well because uh, we influx of uh, new people in the city of New York, and, and this is the finest city in the world. But if you go upstate New York, it, it is pockets of upstate New York that it is just mind-boggling. It's almost like Appalachia. And on the premise that in the last, since he's been governor, we've lost over a million people that have left the state. And it's not because of the bad weather. It's because of high taxation. It's because of the lack of jobs upstate New York. People who live and work upstate New York, those who have jobs up there, the kids go to school, go away to college, and never come home because there's nothing for them. There's nothing for them upstate. And this is a beautiful state. When I first got involved in politics, we had 44 congresspeople. 44. We now have 27. In two years, I submit to you, G-Man, we're going to have 25. That's a signal that our state is in a tailspin downward. That's not good. It's not healthy. Uh, and everyone is fleeing to low-tax states. And for the record, in 2018, a number of published reports confirmed what you're saying about people leaving New York, and many are taking up residence in southern states like Georgia and North Carolina. Correct. Texas, Arizona, Florida, South Carolina, North Carolina, Tennessee, uh, all those states are growing. And... If they can grow, why can't we? Another good point, California has 20 million, there's another state in trouble, but they have 20 million people more than we have living in their state. Yet our state budget, we spend 25 billion, 25 billion more than the state of California. So there's something wrong with with the math here, in the, and there's something wrong the way we govern. As you're well aware, a number of politically significant events have occurred in New York over the last three decades. If you had to choose, which one would you say played the greatest role in altering the trajectory of conservatism in this state? I'd have to say the election of, of Andrew Cuomo. Uh, yeah, I remember it was Andrew Cuomo who said there is no room in the state of New York for people who are pro-life, who support the Second Amendment, and are conservative. There's no room for them here in the state of New York. I mean, here's the man who says we he wants to be open and diverse and welcome everybody, but he makes it very clear. He uh, dis disagrees very strongly in people like myself and my point of view. Look, I am not going any place. I'm not leaving New York. I'm staying in New York, and I'm not going to be chased out of New York. And my hope is that we will be able to turn the tide because they're going to overstep their boundaries, and they continue in their, you know, leftward lurch. Um, I mean, it seems like he's in a race with Bill de Blasio to be five steps to the left of de Blasio, or and then de Blasio tries to get two steps further to the left than he is. And that's... That's not a good thing for the state of New York. I had hoped uh, when he first ran for governor, I had hoped that he was going to govern as a centrist. And uh, I knew I wouldn't agree with well, many of the things that he was going to do, but I, I, I had hoped that he was going to control spending. He was going to um, understand that the taxpayers were in trouble here in New York. He was going to understand that we were losing high earners in the state of New York by moving to other states, they may have a residence here, but they moved, they changed their residence so they could save money. And uh, we're starting to see that. We have a tremendous deficit in the state of New York, and that's mainly because of uh, the taxation that we're dealing with. Okay, your answer to the last question may apply to what I'm going to present next, so humor me. Complete the sentence. I've called out and confronted scores of politicians during my 30-year tenure, but I truly believe the policies and practices introduced and enacted by blank have irreparably damaged the state. Look, my dad was a Democrat. 
Okay? Um, God bless his soul, he's no longer with us. But before he died, he was no longer a Democrat. And as he didn't necessarily agree with me when I became a conservative, he was scratching his head figuring why I was a conservative and he was a Democrat. As time went on, um, he switched and joined the conservative party, not because I converted him, because he looked at me and said, this is not the Democratic Party that I once knew. This is not the people who represented me. My father was very astute, somewhat involved, and he left the Democratic Party because they had shifted so far. And that was, we're talking, I'm talking 20 years ago. Now, if you take a look at where they are today, I mean, I served on the New York City Council. I served when there were 35 members of the city council. I was the only registered conservative ever to sit on the New York City Council. I worked with Democrats there. They were not all of them, but most of them were reasonable, had common sense, and dealt with issues. We had differences, but we were able to work together on issues. That's not the case. You take a look at the New York City Council today. I mean, they are just at a step with, I don't even under, think they understand what the Constitution of the United States is all about. Okay, hold on a second, because that's a very serious statement. Now, you may believe that to be the case, but an argument could be made that the council members are simply taking a hardline position and refuse to negotiate unless the group or person sitting across the table is willing to look at an issue from their perspective. I'm going to make probably a statement that maybe a lot of listeners to this show, uh, to this interview, probably won't agree with me. Uh, but I'm going to use the city council, for example, and, and some of the legislators that are in now in the state government. I truly believe they don't understand the history of this country. I truly believe they don't understand um, what the Constitution is about. I truly believe, from my point of view, that they understand what the founding fathers really wanted to do, have and why they uh, created the greatest country in, in, in the entire world. This is the greatest country, the best experiment that anyone's ever, mankind's ever seen. We're not perfect. But boy, we have, we have some great nation here. But this nation was created by people, not by government. And the trouble is now, most legislators, city council, state legislators, clearly the Democratic Party, and a hell of a lot of Republicans, too, really believe government can do it better than people can. And I, I disagree with that type of thinking. Uh, once government starts doing more and more, and they are doing more and more, you slowly lose your freedoms and your rights. What was your biggest accomplishment as chairman of the Conservative Party of New York State? I had... First of all, I never take credit for any of the accomplishments because it was... Well, you're doing it today. Come on. <laughs> Don't hide. Don't hide. I've been honored to serve with a great group of people uh, who were very helpful to me. While I was chairman of the party, I was just one of the spokes in the wheel. And I was honored that they supported me and I was able to be their voice. But I didn't do this alone. I did this with a lot of hard work from a lot of people up and down the state of New York, from Niagara County all the way up to Montauk. We've had some real patriotic people that are members of the party. Uh, and my greatest honor was to serve as a presidential elector for Ronald Reagan in 1980. In 1984, I cast a vote both times for Ronald Reagan in the state of New York. That was quite an honor because he was clearly, in my early days, my political, from 1964 on, he was my political hero. So that was a great honor. It was a great honor to elect a governor of the state of New York, an attorney general, a United States senator. We've had some, and we elected our own United States senator, Jim Buckley, back in 1970. So we've had some, we've had some great victories. We've lost more than we've won, but we stayed the course. We held on to our beliefs. We didn't try to change with the times. And I still believe our policies, our views, our beliefs are the best answer for the future of our state. That said, what was your biggest regret? Well, I don't know if I have any regrets because I had, I mean, look, I've had disappointments, not regrets. I had a 
many disappointments, and those disappointments uh, uh, when we lost certain races that I think would have made a difference for the state of New York. Uh, I was very, very involved in the um, when uh, in the race against uh, Mario Cuomo, Lou Irwin, who ran for governor, and by the skin of the teeth, just lost very narrowly. I believe that was a turning point for New York. If Lorem would have won, I think New York would have taken a different path. And I wouldn't be talking to you about uh, that we're losing congressmen. I would be talking to you that we are growing, the state is growing. I, he, he would have set the stage and built the foundation to move uh, New York in the right direction. And so I, I would say if that's the biggest disappointment, you want to make that a regret, I regret that because I worked very hard in that race and I just couldn't believe that um, that was an opportunity that was missed by uh, the state of New York. What role did your family play, if any, in helping you fulfill your obligations to the Conservative Party of New York State? Well, I have nine children, and I had a wife that was very supportive. I would have never been able to do what I've done for the last 30 years as state chairman and 17 years as Kings County chairman. So all total, I've put in 54 years, you know, and, and party member for 54 years. She allowed me the, um, the latitude to travel up and down the state of New York, to be out night after night, um, going to various civic meetings, speaking engagements, serving on the city council, going to D.C., at different events. Uh, my wife was very supportive, and my children, um, who all live in New York City, um, understand what I did. And and um, all of them appreciate, uh, and they know they all played a part. And as they grew up, some of them, I don't think they regret it, but many of them spent many hours giving out literature door to tour with me uh, to promote our candidates or programs or policies. It was definitely a family affair. Without a doubt. What will you miss most about the position you held? Well, I guess I'm going uh, I, to... I said in the beginning of the interview that I was not going away. I'm going to still dabble in politics. I know what happens when I give up this role that I'm, I'm, I'm going to lose the bully pulpit somewhat. I intend to try to speak out where I can, when I can. Um, and I'm going to miss working with uh, the men and women, uh, the party leaders throughout the state. But the time had come. I, I, uh, I was struggling uh, with this decision um, I was getting tired of driving the bus. I really just want to get in the bus. And I've been driving the bus for 30 years. So I don't mind if someone else getting behind the wheel and I want to get in the bus and help them do whatever I can do in a, probably in a much smaller way. And I want to do things that I want to do, not what I have to do. So I'm, I'm going to miss working with the men and women of the Conservative Party. I'm going to miss the probably the loud bully pulpit that I have at times. But I intend to um, not just uh, turn out the lights and go to sleep. I intend to leave the lights on and get on the bus and yell out the side window of the bus and not be in charge of the steering wheel. Will you miss doing interviews with yours truly? <laughs> Well, let's put it this way. I will do an interview. Uh, if you would have a has-been, I will do an interview anytime you call. You know what? You need to stop with that has-been nonsense, okay? <laughs> <laughs> and final question. If you could choose your successor, would you be more inclined to select a shrewd, vastly experienced, old-school conservative or the conservative version of Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez? <laughs> I think I would hope that my successor uh, would hold on to many of the uh, foundations that I built and lift this party higher than I was able to do. I think we're going to have such a person, and hopefully that will happen. But um, I think uh, we need a solid philosophical conservative and someone who has the ability and the better uh, understanding of 
the technologies that exist today to expand the reach of the party. Based on what you just said, you prefer a political veteran over someone young with fresh ideas on how to take the conservative party in a new direction, right? Well, almost anybody who takes my place is going to be younger than me, so that's a good plus. <laughs> that's a plus right there, okay? But that person should be a veteran and understand uh, the history of the party and have a strong sense of the platform of the party and uh, possess those beliefs. We're not a party for all occasions. We're a party to have a clear set of values and principles. And that new person has to continue that, just expand the reach of it. You know, I can't end this interview without making people aware of the fact that you've always shown the utmost respect for me and my work, and you never hesitated when an invitation was extended for you to appear on the show. In true U.S. Marine fashion, you were always direct and pulled no punches when hard questions were posed about your political views, the Republican Party, some of the central figures of the party, and vital issues of importance to conservatives in New York State and abroad. You're a stand-up guy, and I thank you for your service to the country and the Conservative Party of New York State. I wish you and your family the absolute best in the days to come. Oh, thank you very much, and God bless you, and appreciate those very nice words. That's going to do it for this edition of the G-Man Interviews. If interested, Feel free to share comments on this episode or submit an interview request at fromthegman at gmail.com. That's F-R-O-M-T-H-E-G-M-A-N, all one word, at gmail.com. It would be great to hear from you. Until next time, stay cool, stay safe, and stay informed.